Welcome everyone to our Sabbath School panel. My name is Eduardo Moreno. And I'm Barbara. And we're going to be studying today Lesson 6, Witnessing to the World. But before we begin, let's pray first. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank you so much for the privilege we have to be studying these lessons. It's so important to be considering the epistles of the Apostle Peter. And as we think of this topic, witnessing to the world, it's so crucial that we be truly right representatives of your truth in these last days. Amen. Forgive our sins and bless us now in the worthy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, when we think about witnessing to the world, we may think, ah, this lesson is a piece of cake. But when we get to the really into the lesson, we realize that perhaps we are not doing everything that the Word of God tells us to do. Our memory text is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of the foolish men. And then the Acts of the Apostles, page 68 says, the crown of Christ is to be lifted above the diadems of earthly potentates. So yes, there are many ways that people have tried to witness. And I will borrow a thought from the pen of inspiration, but there is only one way that will do good. Mm -hmm. And according to this, is what is well doing but what does that mean and that is what we're going to discuss today i think of there's a, a proverb that says answer not a fool according to his folly lest thou be like him right and then there's another one that says answer a fool according to his folly and it says they're going to be foolish men that are ignorant but they won't be able to complain too much if they see an example that they can appreciate that they say, wow, this is, this is the right way to go. And that's the kind of people we want to be, to, to be those ex kind of examples like Jesus was that's for the correct. whole world. I mean, there always be foolish people in the context of not understanding the gospel. They will say things and do things that, according to God, is not right. Yeah. But... For proper witnessing, it is more than just preaching. It's more than just be try to be nice. There's more to it than, than just that. But let's go to the first part of the lesson. There is a definitely a war that we need to, to be aware of. It's very often mentioned that when a person is baptized, if we think that Satan will leave them alone, that's not true. Yeah. It is true that they have enlisted in the army of the Lord, but that doesn't mean that Satan will not be there to try to disrupt their mm. training, mm. per se. So, what is the most challenging battles that every Christian or every pilgrim has to fight. Well, Peter brings out, um, dearly beloved, as I beseech you as pilgrims and uh, strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. So we all know that we have an appetite problem. And the, you know, sometimes I remember being overweight and thinking, wow, if it would be a lot easier if I just didn't eat at all. I mean, if, never, if we never had to eat, it wouldn't be an issue, an issue because yeah. that would be very clear cut. But we have, we need to eat. We need to, there's certain things that we have in life that are legitimate things. And we have to make sure that everything is by the, according to the plan of God. And the first temptation that the human race fell on was appetite. Appetite, yeah. Yet, 
the lesson brought out uh, another verse in 1 John that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, these things are all part of that same picture. And the, um, the note brought out, of course, every injurious gratification of appetite or passion, every perverted appetite becomes a luring lust. And so it wars against the person. And, you know, sometimes we talk about the health message and the, the, the way that the plant-based diet, rather than a flesh-based diet, helps us be physically better. And there's no question about that. But I don't know about you, but I remember in my experience in making that transition, the thing that struck me the most was that my mind was more clear, more spiritual perception, understanding things that didn't make sense before, for example, in the Bible. And I know other people have expressed that same thing. The, um, the warning is given that, that Jesus knew that the indulgence of perverted appetite would so deaden man's perceptions that sacred things could not be discerned. Right. So the way people eat, the way they conduct themselves can make or break their spirituality and their ability to discern things. And of course, the, the power of, of this is found in the fact that Jesus was willing to fast for us. Right. For nearly six weeks. Yes. And, um, you know, when, when, when you mention uh, lasting after uh, f food, it does have some other connotations as well, because it's not just the food, but everything else that goes together. Yeah. It comes to mind the, the experience of Herod mm -hmm. uh, when he was, they were not, they were having a feast. They were eating, but at the same time, they were also drinking. Yeah. And his mind was not right. Mm -hmm. So when Herodias came and, or rather, I should say her daughter came and she started performing for all the, the people there. And he said, I will give you half of my kingdom if it was necessary. If it would have been in his right mind, he wouldn't say so. Yeah, yeah. But then she took advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And of course, the result of that was the beheading of John the Baptist. Wow. So it does have an effect upon the mind. And this is something that, that we need to, to war against. And it's very interesting because uh, in 1 Peter 2.11, he uses one word, and that is abstain, mm -hmm. which is it's a synonym of temperance. Mm -hmm. But it also means restrain self from doing or doing something that we are enjoying, but it has a pleasure, mm -hmm. not for the good. So that means mm. that if we abstain from something, most, most of the times is because it's not good. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, yes, in this uh, war that we have for the salvation of our souls and also for the salvation of other souls, as much as the world has influence upon society, we should be an influence for them as well. And, mm -hmm. and in, in doing so, we will uh, be winning the battle. And, and it's very interesting because um, in, in witnessing for others, yes, you know, we, especially we Adventists, we need to live what we preach. Mm -hmm. And if we say temperance is very important, then we need to be temperate in all things, not just in the things that we think we should be temperate. Yes. And, and that comes in, 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 in every aspect, sleeping, mm -hmm. talking, and you name it. We can go down the road with the same, yeah. same, uh, same thought. And yet uh, the idea is that we should be prepared properly in order to witness. Because you brought up a point that Jesus prepared himself, right? Yes. At the beginning of his ministry, yeah. during those six weeks. Yeah. And it shouldn't surprise us that if Satan did it to Jesus, he will do it to us. He came and mm -hmm. he tempted him. So do we think that we are going to be far from being tempted? 
No. You know, it's interesting. Also, as you were mentioning, this makes an impression on the world. I remember myself not being a Christian yet and being very impressed with somebody in my rooming house that she, she didn't have a big rich dessert. She would just have like one graham cracker, you know, for dessert. And that made such an impression. She wasn't trying to make a show. She just, that's what she did. And I looked and I thought, how does she have so much self-control? And the secret was she was dedicated to Christ. And Christ gives us power. Christ gives us that strength. Yes, And we can be does. so thankful. And other people like to see that in real everyday people nowadays. And then they realize, wow, if, if Christ can do that for that person, he can do it for me too. Exactly. And, you know, I, I do remember when, when I began to change my diet. Mm -hmm. And for me, I was enjoying the fact that health-wise I was getting better, mm -hmm. you know, because I was suffering from a lot of asthma attacks and allergies and all these things. But yet my parents were concerned that I was going to deplete my body of the proper nutrients. Yes, yeah. But at the end of the time that the doctor said, if, if you do this for this period of time, I felt much better. Mm. And when my parents were trying to convince me to go back to the old diet, I said, I am not going back there. Mm -hmm. And my dad said, are you going to uh, continue with this diet? I said, yes, mm -hmm. I feel better. I said, you don't understand because you don't have asthma, oh, wow. but I do. Wow. And, and they had to respect that. Yeah. And, you know, I did not change in the sense of uh, becoming rebellious or anything. Yeah. I was the same person. Sure. Yeah. So, yes, it does something to us if we follow, you know, the, what the Bible gives us as a way of life. Amen. Moving on to the second part of the lesson. It says here, preaching through good works. So that means that if it's necessary, when we are doing our things in this life, you know, driving maybe, or going to the bank or to the supermarket, we, with that attitude, we are presenting a sermon mm -hmm. to That's the people. True. Everything we do is, yeah. And so, even though people may say, oh, they are, you know, maybe strange because they, they don't do this, they don't do that. There's a lot of, they say, there's a lot of no's in, in that religion, but they don't think about the, the good things that we can do. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so, um, there is an experience here that is brought up in our conversation when um, it says, why are, are all true Christians perceived as strangers and even enemies of this world? Now, does the world consider us enemies? In some places, yes. Mm -hmm. In other places like the United States, I mean, we are free to practice our religion because that is written, right, in the, yeah. in the Constitution. But in other places, not. Mm -hmm. So what is the best course that we, that we can take? Well, it mentions having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. In other words, among the world, we have to have, when it says conversation, it's, it's talking about conduct and behavior. And so when they see that we are honest, that we are sincere, and they may be tempted to say something bad, you know, because for some reason, Christians make other people feel guilty sometimes, not because not because we've done anything to make them feel guilty, their own sin condemns them. And then they see that's that correct. somebody that takes their sins to Jesus to have them forgiven, they can sense that. I remember looking at Christians in my mind and thinking there were a bunch of little white lights walking around, you know, like little light bulbs, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and, and that was the way my imagination pictured it. But it says, by, their good, by your good works, um, which they shall behold, they'll glorify God 
ultimately. And um, it mentions Christ is not understood in the time of Jesus. It talks about the, to the Jews it was a stumbling block. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't grasp it. And to yeah. the Greeks it was just plain foolishness. Well, I mean, they just couldn't even understand what, what the point was. And um, these things it mentions, they're spiritually discerned. Yes. It's not something that the education of the world or the culture of society will teach us. It's, it's through the impartation of the Holy Spirit as the person is seeking God deep in their heart. Right. And, you know, I was trying to think in the time of the apostles, okay, that when, when they were sent to preach the gospel to other nations, and, and we find that in Paul's case, because this is where many of the letters that we have in the New Testament, he wrote them, and we have, thank, thank, thank to the Lord, we have copies of it, and then we, we can have the Bible. You know, for the Greeks, they had so many gods, and so the Romans. Yeah. And for them, for this religion that had, that, that had only one god, they were monotheistic in nature, mm -hmm. just one God. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, yes, for them, the Christians were foolish. Why only one God when we can have so many gods? Interesting observation, yeah. Yeah, huh. and also most of the gods, probably by the time the Greeks and the Romans had gods, uh, they were not doing human sacrifices, Yeah, but the, the pagans were. Yeah. And in most cases, the, the priest in these uh, pagan religions, they will require sacrifices, human sacrifices to appease their gods. Here it was a god that sacrificed for the people. Yeah, the other so, way around. The other way around. Yeah. So when you analyze these things, no wonder Paul wrote this that, you know, for the... For the Jews, even then, the stumbling block, and to the Greeks, what? Foolishness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and not only, the, not only they, were, they were teaching that this, this God that got killed, got crucified, gave his life, shed his blood, but yet that resurrected, you know, those, those things were, were new concepts to a certain degree yeah. for all these people. Yeah. But yet, Paul says, those things, they are foolishness unto them. For why? Because these things are spiritually discerned. But it is for us the same thing. For example, we believe in creation. Mm -hmm. We believe that God created everything, heaven and earth, and all the things that we have on this earth in six days. Mm -hmm. And yet the ma majority of the people and even some Christians today believe that there is room in the Bible for, yes, for what God did, but then there is room for evolution too. And the other ones, of course, they believe just on evolution. Yeah. But, you know, that's not what, what it's all about. You know, God says he was done this way and that's the way how even scientifically, it has been proven that it is possible. Sure it is, yeah. So the preaching of the cross for the world, most people don't understand it. They can see us anywhere, and they can even see us happy, but they don't understand why. Mm -hmm. But yet, we need to witness to them through what? Through our good works. You know, I was looking at something. Um, it wasn't in the lesson, but it was the same point here. That there was one place, it mentions that the Sabbath keepers, they were talking about Jesus coming. But, and they were trying to be economical. They would have some bargaining that they would do with okay. people. And they were always trying to get the best end of the deal. And this was a stumbling block in that area. Hmm. In, that, in that locality, people were tired of it. And I was thinking, we need to search our hearts and see if there's some ways that we may be offending people, trying to do something good, save money, yeah. But we always have to be doing the golden rule, thinking about how the other person feels. 
and the world is watching us to Definitely. see whether we care about them, whether we consider others better than ourselves, or we're just looking out for number one. And so these are some of the ways that we can preach through good works and not be a stumbling block through good works. Right. For, the, through bad works, rather. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we need to think about the techniques yeah. that we need to use in order to be able to reach the people mm -hmm. without compromising our beliefs, yeah. right? That's, that's the main thing. But, you know, how, what are those techniques that we can use in preaching the gospel when we are dealing with the ignorant and the foolish? Yeah. Well, it mentioned the key, neck, key verse that you opened with, with well-doing to put to silence the ignorance of, of foolish men. But I, I like the way the, the note also brought out, um, let all who are in error be treated with the gentleness of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, we see flaws all over this world. I mean, there's just flaws and mistakes and problems and everybody falls short. And how do we treat people when, when that kind of such situation happens? How would we want to be treated? Yeah. You know, we like people to be patient with us when we Definitely. make mistakes. And how, how important it is that we have that compassion. It says, remember we're to re represent Christ in his meekness and gentleness and love. And even if we meet with the bitterest opposition, do not denounce your opponents. So Christians are not to be argumentative people. No. You know, looking for to win a debate. Right. You know, sometimes it's... The observation has been made that we can win a debate and lose a soul. And lose the soul, yeah. You know, and uh, so the tenderness and patience, and especially toward those who oppose us, that's where it really can make a difference. Yes, and you know it's very hard, but when you think about Jesus mm -hmm. and everything he went through, not only in the last three days of his life, but for three and a half years. Yeah. How many times they tried to stone him? Yeah. How many times they tried to push him through a cliff? Yeah. You know, and, and many other things that that he had to go through. And yet he's he he appeals to us to come to him because he's meek and lowly in heart. Mm -hmm. And he says, and you shall find rest for your souls. Amen. So there is something about being meek, yeah. something about being patient, yeah. something about having gentleness, how to deal with people. And, and I can think of Moses. Yeah. And yet one time, just one time he lost it. Yeah. In 40 something years. Before that 40 years, yes, he lost it. You know, he killed a, an Egyptian, Egyptian. And, but then he, he, he kept himself in, in the right path. Amen. But then, you know, through, the, through his own people, they pushed him to, he was holding back. And, you know, he was human too. Yeah. And then he lost it. But to what, to what extent? Mm -hmm. You know what? Yes, even though he was forgiven because he he asked for forgiveness. Yeah. But God said, "This is enough." You know, from here on, is somebody else will have to lead. Yeah. So we need to be very careful, as as you say, because we can offend offend people and lead them to to a path that there may be no return yeah. for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. What is it then that, that we need to do? Yes, we need to do good works, right? Yeah. We need to think about our influence. But th there is an aspect of the Christian faith that is, I wouldn't say it's hard to accomplish, but we don't like that word. Yeah. And that is submission. Right. When, when, we say, when we say to somebody, you have to submit, actually, that word is not much used anymore. But when, when the concept comes to us as, as humans, we, we push back. Yeah. And we're, we're told 
to, to submit. It says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king is supreme to governors and so forth. And it mentions um, honor all men. I think this is very important. Servants of God, honor all men, love the brother of fear God, honor the king. When I think of the word, the real meaning of the word submit, like you were saying, sub is like a submarine, it's below. Right. And mission is, is what we're carrying out. So we're, we're below the people, but we don't mind. And I think of Daniel in the yes. courts of Babylon. I mean, Daniel was such an example, and king after king knew that they could trust him right. because they know he had no ambition for position. He didn't worry right. about stuff like this. He was thinking about heaven. He yes. wasn't thinking about political advantage and gain and, and to be a big shot. And they all knew they could trust him. Right. And that's so amazing because we know at least Nebuchadnezzar, a big impression was made on him and, and possibly on others too. And the angels wrote down the influence that Daniel the influence. had yes. in the court there. Yes. And you know, we have the civil authorities, like in what that's what the lesson brings out, the third part. Which, which is Christian submission. And, but to what level do we need to submit? Mm -hmm. Should we submit to everything? Or there is a limit to that? I think it was interesting that um, Apostle Peter, they couldn't, and the other um, apostles, they couldn't restrain themselves from talking about Christ. Right. They said, we, we have to. You can tell us not to talk about it, but Christ is, is <laughs> salvation, you know? And I think of um, the midwives in yes. Egypt. They're the supposed midwives. to throw these, they're supposed to kill these babies? Come on. They're not going to do that. And they, they had the fear of God. They said, we have to answer to God for the life of these little babies. Yeah, you know. and what is interesting, this is this was a command from Pharaoh. Yeah, it was not just um, the prime minister; it was right. Pharaoh himself. Yes. and what motivated them to 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 go this route? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. But in, in under Exodus one verse seventeen says, "But the midwives fear." God and did not as the and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. So the fear of God, mm -hmm. and I believe that this is the key to understand that, that will that will helps us to discern when we need to to be submissive to the authorities, mm -hmm. and we when we should not. Be submissive mm. to the authorities. Okay, you know we know that we, we should not go over the speed limit. We know that we should not pass the red red lights, right? Mm -hmm. We we know that if uh, if there is a person that is going to cross the street and we are coming, they do have the right of way. We have a lot of a lot of things, a lot of laws that are good in of itself, but yet if we disrespect that, what well, what's what's going to happen? Well, in in an essence in essence, that those examples that you're giving, those pertain to the second table of stone right. commandments. In other words, those things pertain to putting somebody's life in danger, in, inadvertently perhaps, but still it could happen, speeding Couldn't. and different things like that. And so, yes, there's every reason to think that we need to obey that because somebody else might get hurt. Now, Daniel, when he was told not to pray to God, but he went to his chamber and kneeled on his knees and prayed three times a day with his windows open. He didn't care. He didn't worry about it. And why was that? Because that was directly to God. Nobody was hurt by that. No. There no. was no victim of him no. doing that. No. In fact, his, his presence in the kingdom was more of a blessing. I think of that statement in the Spirit of Prophecy that says, the world owes more than they realize to the presence of Christians. In, in the world yeah. that that allows a lot of the judgments that would be coming upon the society to be restrained by the yeah. mercy of God for his people and the others too. Yeah, earlier you mentioned uh, about Daniel as well. Mm -hmm. You know how he 
he respected God. And, it, and, and for me, it's very interesting because, and others respected him. Yeah. Two kingdoms mm -hmm. and several kings yeah. because he was King Nebuchadnezzar, then he was his grand, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's grandson and so forth. Then Darius and the other. Yeah. So I was thinking, so why? And there was only one reason. Who preserved Daniel? It was God himself. Yeah. Right? And God knew that Daniel was a good witness mm -hmm. for him. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that, the, I mean, when you read in, in Daniel chapter 6, the entire uh, story of the these governors that came and appeal to the king to his pride and all this mm -hmm. they did it with with a they were jealous of exactly. of, of daniel yeah but yet god overruled all this mm -hmm. and and what i understand is that daniel had let those kings know who the god of heaven was he must have yeah because it says that that when the king was worried the next day when he had thrown in exactly. the lion's den, he said, Daniel, is thy God who thy service exactly. day and night? Is he able to de deliver So you? he knew. Yeah, he knew. He knew. And the king realized yeah. what the others had done. Yeah. And he couldn't sleep. So God, God had a good witness. Daniel lived what my calculus are that he lived about almost 80 years old. Had to be, yeah. Yeah, or maybe perhaps a little more. Yeah, yeah. But throughout his whole life, since he when when he arrived into Babylon, to the end of his life, he was just being a witness. You know, it's interesting. Um, Daniel makes the observation to the king. By the way, so to speak, O king, I've done no hurt. And then I think of the way he addresses the king too. This guy has just thrown him in the lion's den the night before. Yes. And he says, oh, king, live forever. You know, what I mean? yeah. you know, no bitterness, no resentment. You know, he just took everything in perspective and in an eternal perspective. And this is the attitude that we have to have, whether it says our words, whether spoken or written, should be carefully considered. And, um, and then, of course, it brought out about the, the war issue. Yes. That we um, have to respectfully, like, like again Daniel did in chapter 1, he respectfully went to the prince of the eunuchs, knowing that, that they weren't going to understand him. They would think he was crazy. But he knew that the God, God could work through the man's heart. And he did. And he did, yeah. yeah. The same thing, you know, since you brought up the issue of the war, you know, this is what we, under, this is the, what we have, um, as a history lesson for us here <clears throat> is that Adventists understood that principle mm -hmm. at the beginning of their, their history. Yeah. And, and what does it say here? This is a principle because it, it is shown by the verses that we read from Acts, from Exodus, and from Daniel that Christians in the past have understood that, yes, there's a time and place to, to obey the laws, the civil laws, but there is a time and place in which I, we have to disregard it. You have to put like, God first. Right, because in, yeah. the, in the case of the Hebrew uh, midwives, the sanctity of life, mm -hmm. they knew that that was against God's law. Yeah. Daniel, he knew that that was also uh, worshiping the king was against God's law. Mm -hmm. So, and then what about taking life? For and sure. that is what we have here. Would you mind reading the, that quote, the last quote about the civil war? I was shown that God's people who are his peculiar treasure cannot engage in this perplexing war. This was referring to the American Civil War from 1861 to 1865. For it is opposed to every principle of their faith. In the army, they cannot obey the truth and at the same time obey the requirements of their officers. 
there would be a continual violation of conscience. conscience. You know, any war can be justified in some ways. It sounds, well, you know, you want to try to help the people that are oppressed or something, and then other people are saying, well, the other ones are oppressed, you know, and this, it's, an, it's a no-win situation. And it's so wonderful to know that God can take matters into his own hands. And we read that in, in Testimonies, Volume 1, that he did that. that and the, as she says, that it was a perplexing war. You know, and and sometimes things seem like they're a worthy cause. Like, for example, when Jesus, uh, Peter tried to stop Jesus from being arrested, and he wanted to chop off the, mm -hmm. the soldier's head, but he missed and just cut off his ear. Well, Jesus put the ear back on. Yeah. And said... He rebuked Peter, actually. Yeah, exactly. And he said, suffer it to be so. The, the cup my father has given me, shall I not drink it? Right. You know, and so Jesus is looking at a much bigger perspective. That's and we correct. need to be his servants looking at a perspective that we may not understand. Yeah. But when we go by his law, his Ten Commandments, we know we're doing his will. Amen. Amen. Yes. And even in our workplace. Yeah. You know, I was thinking, okay, we already mentioned Daniel, but Daniel was even though he, he had a high office, he was still a slave. Yeah, he was a slave. He still was. Yes. So, they, but he performed his duties in such a way that he went from one kingdom to the next in the same position. And working for the well-being of all of them. Of all of them. No, That's correct. No petty jealousies or anything like that. Or It was amazing. That's why they loved him so much. And another uh, example came to mind was Nehemiah. Yes, yes. Can you imagine a cupbearer and, and being able to get so close to the, to the king mm -hmm. that God gave him, God put him there for a reason. Probably at the beginning, he didn't understand why yeah. he had to be the cupbearer. But then later, he understood probably and said, God put me in this position for a reason. Yes. And when he asked, the answer of the king was, sure, go ahead, and you have all this. Can you imagine if our faith would be such a faith as all these men and women, because yeah. you mentioned women here, the midwives, that we will be faithful to God no matter where and what we're doing, but we do the right thing. How God will bless us in such a way that... Uh, yeah, it mentions it's, to be subject to our ma the masters with all, even if we're a servant. And I like the way it says there is science in the humblest ki kind of work. Yes. And if all would regard it, they would see nobility in labor. So even if it's some kind of menial task, whatever we do is we do it heartily unto the Lord and not unto man. Not unto man. And, and that is the key. Yeah. Doing it for the Lord. Yeah. Not for anybody else. Yeah. But of course, as we... Remember the first part of the lesson, you know, we are in a war, and so we will suffer. Yeah. And wrongfully. Yeah. Not necessarily for the right cause, mm -hmm. but great majority of the time will be for the wrongfully. So, when we are offended, mocked, and mistreat it. Mm -hmm. What is our tendency? <laughs> we try to get the thing back in place and, and let people know that that's not the way we want to be treated and so right. forth. Yeah. Right. But what is the appeal made here to us? Yeah. It says, for this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when you're buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently. Huh? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. So it's understandable that we would get trouble right. for wrong behavior. But what about if we haven't done anything wrong? Right. You know, and the Lord is telling us not to 
be overcome of evil, but overcome but, evil with good. Exactly. And I like uh, Romans 12, verse uh, 20, mm -hmm. because it, it, therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him, and if he thirst, gave him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. It seems like the ultimate revenge, but, you know, he's just giving a vivid illustration here that it's really going to impress him. You're going to get his attention if you're really nice instead of being mean. That's of course. amazing. I mean, and they, for sure, they will say, you're crazy. Yeah. But <laughs> the, it's refreshingly crazy. If, of you course, know. <laughs> of course. But, you know, it is the practicality of our religion that makes people wonder, you know, yeah. for the Greeks was what? Foolishness. <laughs> Foolishness. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. for us, it's not because yeah. it is the way the Lord wants us to live. This is the issue. Yeah, it says we cannot afford to let our spirits chafe over any real or supposed wrong done to ourselves. Self is the enemy we most need to fear. So sometimes the offense really wasn't even there. Our imagination came up, decided to be offended. And whether it's real or whether it's fake, it doesn't matter. We can't let our spirits chafe over it. And I think of that word chafe like when yes, you I, I have on really, your skin, you know, right. and it's really rough against it and making it sore, you know. And it says we should not allow our feelings to be easily wounded. We're to live, not to guard our feelings or our reputation, but to save souls. This is what we're about, you know. And if somebody wants to malign us behind our backs, well, that's their problem. Do yes. not retaliate, you know, just don't give them any reason to even do it. They might come up with it anyway because of their imagination. But um, so you avoid the appearance of evil. So do all in your power without sacrifice of principle to conciliate others. And if impatient words are spoken to us, don't reply in the same spirit. Yeah, it's better to bite our tongue and to count until 10. Yeah. At least we'll cool off a little bit. Yes. Yeah, so uh, there, you know, we are all, we all going to be tempted. Our name, our religion, mm -hmm. our practices will be called into question. Mm -hmm. But if we keep our mind in Christ, because this is the only way to, to suffer wrongfully and yet act the opposite, mm -hmm. not with vengeance, not with bad words, not with a wrong action, but to remain a Christian. Yeah. That's the whole thing. Yeah. And, and it's not easy unless we understand that the building of our character will affect whether we will reach eternity or not. Yeah. Yeah. That is. That's true. And and uh, under question B here, that's the first note. This is this is very very interesting because it says the mysterious providence which permits the righteous to suffer persecution at the hand of the wicked had been cause of a great perplexity to many who are weak in faith. Isn't that so? Yeah. Some are even ready to cast away their confidence in God because He suffers the basis of men to prosper. While the best are purest, are afflicted and tormented by their cruel power. Then the question, how, is it asked, can one who is just and merciful and who is also infinite in power tolerate such injustice and oppression? The answer is, this is a question with which we have nothing to do. Huh. God has given us sufficient evidence of his love, and we are not to doubt his goodness because we cannot understand the working of his providence. The thought came, Joe. Yes, yes. I mean, the poor man not only lost his cattle and camels and you name it. Everything. But his children. Children. Yeah. But How we will react? We see the curtain unveiled at the beginning there, the conversation between God and Satan. Right. And, and 
the way the book is written, we can sort of understand it then. But had we been there at that time and had been Job, it would have been... It would have not been easy, that easy. No, I, yeah. You know, we need to be honest and sincere. But, but the good thing is that, you know, this is why we have these lessons. Yes. To remember, uh, to remind us that we are not done yet. Right. That we need to continue learning. And if we learn the lesson, then we will live forever. Yes. That's the wonderful thing about this. I think I like this last paragraph too. It says, the Lord does not forget or neglect his children, but he permits the wicked to reveal their true character, that none who desire to do his will, God's will, may be deceived concerning them. Again, the righteous are placed in the furnace of affliction, that they themselves may, may be, be purified. purified. Yeah, this is our aim. This so we aim. should not... Uh, we should not flee right. <laughs> this, the, anything that, that happens. And also, we should not say, why me, Lord? Yeah. We should ask, why, Lord, you want me to go through this? Yeah. What lesson is there for me? Yeah. But of course, it's easier to be saying that than to... At the time that it's happening, we always expect it's going to be something different than it is. And then when it's something we didn't expect, it's... Challenging. It's challenging, yeah. yeah. So at last, you know, when we contemplate all these things, we say, Lord, I am not ready. Yeah. I'm not ready. Yeah. But... But he's letting us find out about these exactly, things so that we can get ready. Exactly. Yeah. But we can do so. Why? Because he has gone before us. Amen. All the things he suffered. Yeah. And we can even say things that are not even written in the Bible, he suffered. Yeah. Because John says that there were volumes could have been written right. about the things that happened, but there was, for whatever reason, it, it didn't get to, to be written. But it is enough for us to understand that in, in God's will, everything has a purpose. Yeah. And the purpose for the Lord is to purify us as as you just read and yet in order to for for metal to be purified or for gold actually yeah. to be purified it needs to go through fire the fire yeah. so the gross can come up and be scooped away scooped away yeah, yeah so that's what the lord wants us to do and and peter understood all this i mean and, and this is the the interesting thing that he was able to write all this without using himself as an example yeah. because I don't know maybe he was ashamed or so but nonetheless he 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 tells us this is the proper way to do these things would you like to read first Peter 2 21 through 24 because it this is an appeal to every Christian it is it is for even hereunto were ye called because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. So every every act that we do, our attitude, our way of reacting to things, if 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 we are connected with the Lord, mm -hmm. then we will be living a righteous life. Amen. It is his life actually in us. The note brings out a very interesting thought here. It says, those who are called to endure torture and martyrdom are but following in the steps of God's dear son. Amen. And I was thinking about um, John Huss. Yeah. 
yeah. and others that had, you know, other people that we don't have their names, but they went through the same experience. And the temptation nowadays, if something like that would happen, we would be inclined to think, oh, they must have done something wrong. Yes. Quite Not the necessary. contrary. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. So the Apostle Peter, he gives us an illustration. And Isaiah brings out the, the fact that you know, we are all sheep and, and we have all gone astray. Yeah. But the good shepherd mm -hmm. goes after those that have gone astray, right? Yes. And it says here, For ye are sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Mm -hmm. According to even... even uh, the illustration of the parable of the lost sheep, we know that Jesus went and rescued the one, mm -hmm. right? And brought it to the fold. And he was glad. He was yes. happy. And it says the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He'll do anything for the sheep that's lost. Yeah. So we're not alone in this war. Yeah. yeah. No, we're not. That's right. We have our Lord Jesus as a companion. The question is, do we, do we really believe that, that he, he is with us? That he wants to dwell with us? That he wants to walk with us? That yeah. he's, he wants to be our counselor, you know, in many decisions that we make, especially when, when we are, in a, are put in a position in which we have to answer for our faith. Yeah. And it can be in a little thing. Yeah. Does it have to be, uh, you know, exposed to the cameras or anything else like that? No. Yeah. It can be in a little thing. Right. But it is through those little things that we will learn how to overcome. Yes. Until the day will come that yes, there will be a, a great persecution. Mm -hmm. It but, mentions that we we have the sympathy and support of the heavenly angels. And our hearts need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And then we can have that victory that you're describing. Right. Yeah. yeah. So may God help us that, you know, as we think about what is coming, because we know the Bible tells us that there will, and Jesus himself said it in Matthew 24, that there will be persecution. Mm -hmm. Even Satan will try to deceive the very elect. Mm -hmm. Satan is trying to put all kinds of stumbling blocks al uh, along a path. Mm -hmm. But yet, if we are faithful, and if we follow these principles, mm -hmm. we will be victorious. Amen. That is the key. Yeah. Because that is, I mean, I go back to the, to, to the fact that it, it is the Apostle Peter that is telling us, because he backslid. Yeah. And yet, our Lord Jesus did not leave him alone. Right. He brought him back. Right. And then this is why we have these lessons that we need to learn to, to live with all men and do our part to be a good example and lead them to the way everlasting. Amen. Amen. Our gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for thy many blessings and especially, Lord, for reminding us that in this world we must be thy witnesses. That we have a lot of work to do, Lord. Help us to prepare ourselves as good soldiers that we may have to go through this training process. And Lord, show us what parts of our character needs to be, need, need, need to be trimmed so we can do, Lord, the work that you have given us. Lord, life is short, but teach us, help us, guide us. Give us, Lord, that which we need in order that we may prepare ourselves, Lord, fully and conscientiously so we can be a, a, a useful tool in thy hands. Please, Lord, forgive us if we have not followed everything that you have given to us to do. But we thank you, Lord, that you have now 
cast us away yet. Give us an opportunity, Lord, to redeem the time and to be a lighthouse, a light on this world that we may guide those that are ready to perish to a safe ground. We thank you and we ask for all these blessings in the precious name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us for this important lesson was talking about keys by which we can really be more effective witnesses to the world. You won't want to miss next, week, next week's lesson that's going to be talking about an appeal to husbands and wives. So may the Lord help us to be preparing that lesson and to continue forward with these character building studies that we can be ready for the coming of Jesus. Amen.